uh, my talk uh, today is going to be more on the cancer. Uh, do you have any friends or relatives or people you know with cancers? You all have somehow, right? So it's a scary thing. Uh, for me, I concentrate more on uh, urology cancer. So I work as a urine system. Uh, they call me an expensive PUB plumber because if your water pipe choke, I must clear. So I also see patients with kidney stones, uh, with a prostate problem, uh, urine leak, urine incontinence, and anything in the urine system. But today I'm going to talk about the cancer. So I'm going to concentrate on the three different areas. So number one, it is the kidney. We usually have two. And then the bladder, all of us have. And also the prostate, only the men have. So I'm going to go in sequence for these uh, areas. So for every cancer, I'm just going to ask uh, two questions and go through the slides. So firstly, I'm going to talk about kidney cancer. Is, it, is cancer important? So if you look at the latest Singapore Cancer Registry, this is the latest one that they published, for the cancer in men, colon cancer is number one, lung is two, but for urine, prostate is number three, and kidney and the rest are within the top ten. For women, as you have already heard, uh, breast cancer is number one, uh, cancer in Singapore, the rest will be colon and lung. So I'm going to talk about kidney cancer. So kidney cancer, majority, most patients have no symptoms. They feel perfectly fine. And then when they come to me for, uh, sometimes go for health screening, a lot of you go for health checkup, suddenly an uh, ultrasound or scan found that there's a kidney tumour. Of course, there are some patients who have cancer that has uh, become bigger. They, you may have blood in the urine and sometimes if the cancer actually spread to the bones at the back, some patients have back pain continuously and that's already stage 4. So most patients actually have no symptoms. What do we do then when we see any kidney tumour? So the good thing is when the kidney tumour is in the early stage, it is still inside the kidney, there are a few things we can do. One is actually if it's very small, we can don't do anything. So you can actually see how the tumour grows because it may grow very, very slowly over the next few years and doesn't affect you. Other things we can do is operation, so surgery, or other ways to kill it off using radiofrequency or cryotherapy. Those are just treatment we use to kill the cancer cells. However, if it becomes stage 4, called the late stage where it's spread elsewhere, there are only a few options, including surgery, chemotherapy, and the last one is immunotherapy, which is using your own immune system to increase uh, the chance to kill off the cells in the body. So far, okay? Am I too fast? You okay? Yeah, stop me if you think it's too fast, okay? So what happens when in kidney tumour? Most, most people know it when they go for health screening. Remember, all your health screening that you go for blood tests and all that does not look at kidney tumour. Because blood tests cannot find kidney tumour. The only way to find is use an ultrasound or some scan. Blood tests cannot tell because there's no blood test marker for kidney tumour. When the kidney tumour are found, most of them are very small and we know that one third of them actually not cancer. So there may be a lump in the kidney, but don't worry, actually one third is not cancer. So you must get a specialist to tell you is it cancer or not cancer. Last time, whenever we see any tumour, we actually take out the whole kidney. It's actually a waste that we found out. So and then after that, one third will say, Alamak, sorry, take out wrongly, no cancer. <laughs> Quite bad, right? But at that time, that was what was done years ago. So now what we know is we only take out part of the kidney with the tumour. It's like if you have a, a pizza, only one piece got tumour, you only take out that piece, all the rest leave inside. So this is called partial nephrectomy. Part of it, take out, but the rest leave there. So you resect tumour and leave the rest in. This is a CT scan of a small tumour. You see this is only a little bit, right? As compared to the rest of normal. So we actually cut like a V-shape and stitch up all the rest. That's the newest way to do it. There are different stages that we can look at kidney cancer. So whenever it is a small tumour, especially what we call stage 1, it is still inside the kidney. So what we do is we take out part of the kidney and leave all the rest behind. This is called partial nephrectomy. So if you have friends who have kidney tumour, don't let doctors take out the whole kidney unnecessarily. So does it mean that uh, there are certain patients that can do? 
some, some doctors will say, I have old patient already, some patient very old, never mind, lah, just take out. Lah. So what we did uh, when I was still in Tan Tok Seng is that we look at patients more than 65 years old, some are 80 plus years old with all these tumours. So what do we do? So we found that some of them have diabetes, 80% have high blood pressure, and already when they are older, a lot of patients already have some form of a chronic kidney disease called CKD, already kidney not so good. What we found that even in the very old patients, more than 65 years old, you should also do partial nephrectomy, meaning remove part of it. If you look at the graph on top, when we do a blood test, okay, click one more, okay. If we do an operation and the blood test for kidney function, if you take out the entire kidney, you look at the lower one, the kidney function become very low, not good forever. But if you take out part of the kidney, actually the kidney cover recover up and go back and at least improve a little bit. So the message is no matter how old a person is, at least in, uh, in Singapore, we should try our best to only take out the tumour and leave the rest of the kidney behind. So how do we do it? Okay. So who is suitable for Da Vinci robot? How many of you know about robot surgery? Okay, let me go through with you. So robot uh, surgery doesn't mean I wake up in the morning, take breakfast, press button, operation done. Wow, that's the best, but it doesn't work. It is actually a robot that I have to learn to control, so it depends on the surgeon who uses the instrument to do a proper surgery. So the robot only helps us uh, do a better surgery. Let me show you how we do it. This is just a picture of how we do it if there's a part of the kidney tumour. There's no sound, I just show you and run through. If there's a kidney tumour, we have this instrument which is inside the body and every one of these instruments is about the size of the pen to do the entire operation. No, I think you can't play. So, look at my slide. So, quite easy, right? Looks very simple, right? Just cut through, remove it. Wow, so simple, yeah. yeah you can do it at home. <laughs> okay, then we change the instrument and then tiny stitches. So, every single instrument is as if my wrist is inside the body but it's through a tiny keyhole. So, that's the advantage of having a robot. You know, there are a lot of patients who you could do keyhole surgery, but keyhole surgery means that uh, you have an instrument in, but the robot has a special arm inside, you can see it can twist. So that's the advantage of having a robot. What happened? This is me in New York City when I was training. Uh, so this is me uh, in the middle looking at operating with my boss, and I must remember every instrument. But when it's a robot, I just sit there, and that's actually the real robot when we can take a rest in the middle and uh, we just use the instrument to operate. The advantage of robot is that it's 3D high definition TV, we can rotate and the view can be seen much better. So that's why there's less blood loss and the wound heals faster because the scar is only the size of the pen, the tiny one. Who is suitable for robotic? Is it everyone? Well, I must say almost everyone at any age, provided the tumour is suitable for removal. Because sometimes you know the kidney is one lump, what happens if the tumour is stuck right in the middle of the kidney? That one is harder to take, but majority, we can do it. So if you have any uh, friends who know have kidney tumour, check with a surgeon whether it's appropriate to try to save the rest of kidney and use robotic. For kidney cancer, summary is symptoms, usually none, no symptoms. And who can do Da Vinci robot as long as there are small tumours in appropriate hands? So let me go through a bladder tumour now. So for bladder cancer, what are the symptoms when patients have bladder cancer? So remember bladder is usually in the pelvic area. Unfortunately, most patients also have no symptoms, don't feel anything at all. Why? Because it's in the urine system. Sometimes when you go to the GP or polyclinic, the doctor will check, oh yeah, I've got blood. So that may be the only time they produce blood. And patients, a lot of uh, bladder cancer patients just have blood in the urine, even though you don't see in the toilet, but the doctor may check it and it's in a, see under the microscope. So that may be the first time people have cancer found. 
There are also the patients who have uh, symptoms that they can actually see blood. When you see blood, sure, very scared, right? Then you quickly go and see the doctor, right? So that is one way. But there are many patients who think they have urine tract infection, especially women. You have frequent urination, you keep having urgent, you must look for a toilet. That is one form of cancer called carcinoma in situ or bladder can have the same symptom as, as a urine infection. So many women may think it's UTI, a urine tract infection. Remember, if it's not uh, resolved, that means you keep taking antibiotic, but you keep having the same thing, it's best to make sure uh, it's not bladder tumour or some other things. Because after taking antibiotic, it should be cleared. Okay? The other thing is, there are patients who have difficulty passing urine. A tumour may be blocking near where the bladder outlet comes out. It's like a stopper. You know, when your kitchen sink, you have a stopper. If something, a tumour blocks it, you may find difficulty passing urine. And if you don't, you cannot empty the bladder properly, you need to keep waking up at night. Because if you don't empty your bladder, it fills up very fast, correct? And then you have to keep going very frequently to the toilet. Yeah, so these are some of the uh, possible warning signs about bladder cancer. What do we do whenever a doctor finds a bladder tumour? There are two main things we have to do. One is to resect it completely, meaning to remove it completely from the body. And the next job, most important, is reduce the chance it will come back again because we don't want cancer to return. If you look at the urine bladder, okay, so I have a magnification of the bladder wall. You know your bladder have a muscle, this uh, dark brown part. So there's always a layer of surface of urine, touches the urine, but there's a muscle. That's why your urine, when, when you have to go to the toilet, the muscle will squeeze the bladder and urine come out. But bladder cancer always form on the surface. If you look at the shape, of bladder cancer. Some look like a cauliflower, some look like a small hump, but there are some that are hidden, flat, you cannot see at all. They are called carcinoma in situ. That means it looks exactly the same. So if you do the best scan, you all know about CT scan, MRI, PET scan, cannot detect. Because if the tumour is flat, it's like a carpet, how would you be able to detect when you do a CT scan, MRI from outside? You can't tell. You can only see the big tree, like a cauliflower type, but the flat type you can't see. Which is why whenever there's blood in the urine, one of the tests we always suggest to do is put a scope just to see and make sure there's no uh, uh, ulcers or no abnormal things inside. That's the reason why. Because some of the bladder cancer is actually flat, like a carpet. These are some of the shapes. I take pictures of some of the tumour we see. If you look at the top left-hand corner, it looks a bit flat, right? Next one, in the middle, or the right-hand side, it looks like a, under, you know, like a coral under the water. So it can look like different shapes and sizes. Our job as a doctor, when we see the tumour, is to do a surgery called TURBT. It stands for Transurethra Resection of Bladder Tumour, meaning through the urine tube, we just scrape it off until the tumour is out of the body. So there's no scar in the body at all. So everything goes through the urine tract and patient, other, your friends or other people may not know you went for a surgery because there's no scar. So after we remove it, our job is to remove entire tumour. But remember, some, the, uh, the, the most important thing is to know what kind of tumour it is. Why is it important? The most important thing is we want to know whether the tumour has taken roots inside. Imagine if you have a tree, how deep the root goes. Remember I told you there's a muscle in the bladder where you squeeze. As long as the root of the cancer do not touch the muscle, it's good. It's called non-muscle invasive. Everything on the left-hand side of uh, my dotted line. It's very important because if the tumour, the root does not touch the muscle, you can keep the bladder. What happens if the root touch the muscle? We have to take out the whole bladder and put the water back for the rest of the life. So it's very important to diagnose early before the root get into the muscle. Once you get into the muscle, the option is entirely removed, then carry it back for forever, which nobody really wants. So, which is why we think it's good to uh, be diagnosed earlier, especially when there's blood in the urine and most people have no symptoms. So that's the key thing we want to highlight. 
what do we do? After, the first thing is to remove the bladder tumor called transurethral resection of bladder tumor. So the key thing is to know whether it involves the muscle or not involve muscle. If it involves muscle, it may be too late, we have to remove the bladder. But if it has not, first thing I tell everyone is stop smoking because smoking actually causes a toxin to be kept in the urine and it causes more bladder cancer. But of course, there are many patients who eat well, smoke well, exercise every day, also get cancer. I'm sure you all have heard of people. Uh, we don't know why it happens, but we do see patients uh, who smoke have a higher chance of bladder cancer. So that's the most important thing. Second thing, there's this thing called intravesical treatment. Intra means inside, vesical means bladder. Remember, after I cut away the bladder tumour, the big tumour I'll take out, but there will be some cells that are floating inside the bladder. Bladder is like a, a water balloon, right? So straight after the surgery, we will give chemotherapy inside the bladder to kill off the floating cells so that it doesn't drop down and be a seed and then it continues growing. So it's called intravesical chemotherapy. I want to go through why is intravesical therapy so important. You have friends who have bladder tumour but they don't get it, uh, don't get this therapy, but I need to tell you this is very important. Immediately after the surgery, we will give the chemo so that the floating cells is killed off. But after we receive the final uh, histology, meaning the specimen, the report, one week later, we want to find out whether the cells contain any of these high-risk features. T1 high grade, these are words that tell me that if I don't get rid of it, it can come back again. So once I see this in the medical report of the surgery, the patient will need to go through another six weeks of intravesical treatment. That means they need more of this uh, treatment within the bladder. They come to the clinic, takes about two hours, then go home. Okay, so far okay? Yeah. So that's the reason why you will find that patients with bladder uh, cancer may need to keep coming back to get chemo within the bladder. The chemo in the bladder does not cause them to lose their hair or reduce their, their immune system because it's not given from the blood. It's just within the bladder. So it's, after that, they can go to work as per normal. So that's a special thing about this chemo given inside the bladder. And we have found that if you give it for a long, long time, including a medication called BCG, Patients can live more than 15 years without problem. So this is the information that we want to say. Always do intra vesical bled in, in, um, medication inside the bladder. So we've gone through the bladder cancer. What are the symptoms? Most patients have no symptoms. Some patients may have blood in the urine, and the urine, you may not see the blood. It can be microscopic. Or some patients present with urine problem urine frequency, you keep going to the toilet, uh, if, or you think you, it may be urine tract infection, well, actually it's a bladder cancer. Why is intravesical therapy important? It reduces recurrence because we don't want cancer to come back. Okay? Any questions about bladder that you want to ask first? Can I go on to the next one? Okay. So the last one uh, is uh, prostate. So prostate only men have, all right? So two things I want to answer. First, how to avoid unnecessary biopsy. Many of us know about this blood test called PSA. This is actually a tumour marker called prostate-specific antigen, but they are not very accurate. This blood test can be higher in normal ageing prostate. It can be higher when it's infection of prostate. It can be higher when there's cancer. So it's not very specific for tumour marker, meaning doesn't mean once it's high, it's cancer. It may not be. It may just be infection. And once it's high, many patients may go through a biopsy of the prostate, which involve putting an ultrasound through the anus and biopsy. Some people do four times, five times, six times. very uncomfortable. So we are finding ways how to reduce it so that we don't get so much unnecessary biopsy. So prostate, as you know, only men have, it's just below the uh, bladder, just below the bladder, okay, connecting the bladder to the penis. The function of prostate is when uh, we have sex or ejaculation, when the sperm comes out, it gives nutrition to the sperm, because the sperm must swim, right, in the woman. If, if not, uh, there's no more nutrition or lubricant. That's why the prostate is there, to give the fluid. Okay. 
Prostate cancer, we know, is the third most common cancer in Singapore men. And unfortunately also, majority have no symptoms, they feel fine. The only way they found out is that the blood test they take is higher. What are the risk factors for prostate cancer for men? Usually, if the father or the uncle on the, on the parent side have cancer, so the gene may be passed down from upper generation down. We also found out recently in the in the US and Europe that even the mother can pass down a prostate cancer gene, even though she's female and no prostate. So now we need to look for both sides of mother and father side, who has cancer, breast cancer, and also prostate cancer. The other risk factor for prostate cancer is when you when we have uh, too much uh, fat in the diet or obesity. And some racial groups like African Americans have the highest in the world. Uh, the other last thing is environment. We are not sure how it affects, but there was a study that looked at Japanese men who was born in Japan. Then their son is born in Japan but moved to Hawaii, and the son gave birth to the grandson. So when they move more to Japanese, they get more and more cancer, even though it's the same genetic line. Don't know whether it's McDonald's or pizza, but we know that when they move, even in the same family, there's higher cancer when they move from one country to another. Okay? But we don't really know which food type, but we know environmental changes. So prostate cancer, unfortunately for most men, they have no symptoms. Only if you do a blood test, then we can find out there's a high uh, blood test called PSA. Of course, there are a few patients who have uh, symptoms. Some patients have difficulty passing urine, blood in the urine, and waking up at night to pass urine. It is normal to maybe wake up once, but more than once is not normal. Many men think that waking up two, three times because of aging is not true. It may be because the prostate is blocking the urine flow, and then uh, they can't empty the bladder, or they have cancer or other reasons. So it doesn't mean that when we grow older, men must wake up a few times. That's not true. Sometimes urine frequency can cause that uh, symptoms too of prostate cancer. If it becomes stage four, when the cancer st spread to the bones, you have back pain and bone pain and affect the kidney function also. And the worst thing is when the cancer spread to the uh, bone, it can cause uh, paralysis and you, can, you won't be walking anymore if it spread to the spine. So it's good to find out early whether there's prostate cancer. What do doctors do when we see the men in the clinic? First, we put a finger into the backside area to check and feel the prostate because you know the prostate is just below the bladder. We do the blood test called PSA and decide to offer a biopsy of prostate when needed. Why do we put a finger into the rectum? That's because if you imagine a prostate as a watermelon, 95%, 90 over percent of the cancer is in the skin of the watermelon. It's not in the meat. It's not in the flesh of the watermelon. Most of it on the skin. We call it peripheral zone. That's why when we put a finger, we can feel it. But remember, when we put a finger, we can only feel one part of the watermelon, right? We cannot feel all around. Not possible, right? Yeah. So we can only feel a part. So it doesn't mean our finger is the best thing. If our finger feels something, it's no good. But if our finger don't feel anything, it doesn't mean nothing, everything is alright. You still need to do a blood test, which is why we need to do both the finger test and the blood test. Alright? Okay? So this is the PSA. The blood test in, the, in Singapore, we know that PSA more than four, we should do a biopsy. That's because out of every four men, one has cancer and three don't have. So the blood test, we will look at this value. PSA of 4. Do you all know her? You know Angelina Jolie? The, she came into the Times, uh, for those of you who are not aware, she came to the front page of this because she took out her, both her breasts when it's completely normal. That's because her family history has cancers in the ovary and they, they found a gene that can, she may have it. So she just said, I just take out the both. Uh, many women did the same thing, many women didn't, so it became a controversy. That's because of a gene that they found in her, gene that can be passed from family to family. 
So, but if you look at the cancers with inheritance, that means passed from family to family, you look at breast cancer, it's 9%, right? How about prostate? It's about the same. So does it mean if your father has prostate cancer, you must quickly go and take out the prostate? <clears throat> so that's a danger for us if we think the same way. So now uh, the urology community is discussing what's the best way to do it. So if you have a um, mother or mother side who has breast cancer and father side who has uh, prostate cancer or breast cancer, do talk to the urologist to see whether we need to screen you for prostate cancer. Okay? So it's both men and women's side. In the past, we think it's only all the men's side. There's, so it's women's side have to think about it as well. In fact, what they think is that this gene called BRCA2 is found in 1 in 20 prostate cancer, even though it's the breast cancer gene, which can be passed down from the mother to the son. All right? So this is something to discuss, um, a message that I want to pass to you all. Okay, so prostate biopsy. Once we think that we need to take some things to the prostate cancer cell to see whether there's cancer, <clears throat> we usually need to put ultrasound into the backside to see the prostate and then take a needle. But almost no man like it, very uncomfortable. And sometimes we need to do repeatedly, right? I said. So how to reduce the chance? One of the ways is to do an MRI <clears throat> of the prostate and then what we do is call the fusion. The MRI that was done a few days ago, we fuse it with a software with the ultrasound and we see exactly where to go. For example, if you look at Singapore map, I think the cancer is in Topayo, Lorong 8, Block 156. Got such block, I don't know. So, when I see the map of ultrasound, I put the Singapore map over, my needle go directly to block 156 together. You can do that when you do MRI and fuse it. So that's our goal. We only want to go to the place where it's more accurate. In the past, when we have no MRI, is <clears throat> uh, we just hamtam anyhow, some in Topayo, some Lorong, Tampanese, Jurong, because we can't see. In the past, it's ultrasound, we can't see anything, as well as MRI. So if you do have a <clears throat> prostate biopsy, do check whether you need the MRI prostate first because you want to be more uh, locate the exact place you want to take. Okay? Ken? How do we do it? So everyone who do this MRI and ultrasound, uh, fusion biopsy, goes to the MRI machine first. Top left-hand corner is the MRI machine. The doctor will look at the MRI image. This is what a prostate looks like and put a red dot, I mean not red colour, but this is what, what I mean. They say this is the place, this greyish part is where I want you to target. So a few days later, bottom left hand, patient come in for the ultrasound, then they include the image of MRI on top with the ultrasound, fuse it, then there's this spot I need to hit. So this is more accurate. So this is one way we hope that uh, we don't have to do so many times of the prostate biopsy unnecessarily. So this is called MRI ultrasound, fusion, biopsy. Okay? Any questions? Quite clear? So that's how we do, use MRI first. So the last uh, question I want to answer is, <clears throat> prostate cancer, when we do operation, you can cause erection problem and can cause urine leak. And some men have to wear diapers for the rest of their life because you remove the stopper of the prostate and then there's a gap, right? When we do a repair of the, of the gap, some patients actually need diapers for a long, long time. And then because the nerve for erection is stuck to the prostate, then they don't get erection anymore. Okay, so these are the two major problems when we do surgery. So can a good robot surgery prevent such thing and say, wow, do robot, expensive machine, right? Then should they have so no side effect? Lah. Yeah. But the answer is, Unfortunately, no. So it does, because it doesn't depend actually on the machine, it depends on the surgeon doing it. And uh, doesn't mean the newest technique can make sure there's no infection, uh, no uh, side effect. But the good thing is side effect can be reduced if the surgeon knows how to do a nerve sparing prostate cancer surgery, meaning we peel off the nerve from the prostate. So if you imagine the same wat watermelon as the prostate, 
the nerve for erection is like scotch tape stuck to it. So the job of a good surgeon is to peel it off without uh, taking cancer along. You only peel the scotch tape out, leave in the body, remove the whole watermelon. Okay? Don't need. Remember, if you see a doctor who does it, who has a machine but don't know what to do, please uh, go to another clinic. <laughs> yeah. Because every surgeon, okay, I should, can see this, right? Uh, I've seen the uh, Parkway Hospital put every doctor inside and say, oh, they are robotic surgeon before, for example, because they have the machine. Or some advertise, advertisement will say, oh, they know how to do it because they bought the newest thing in, in, uh, where they have. So just check, make sure you know uh, whether this person just buy it for the sake of buying or they actually know how to use it. That's the key. All right? So have, have you all seen any video of the uh, robotic surgery? No. Uh. Can I show you? Why the robot uh, is something useful? May I show some YouTube? We are... Can you all hear? Okay, so this is what it looks like. This is actually an a example of how the robot is doing in the body. This is a precision of how the robot can do. That's the robot. So this is the advantage of robot surgery, um, which can be done, okay? So in summary, these are the few questions uh, I was talking about. For kidney cancer, I asked uh, what are the symptoms for kidney cancer? Usually none. Uh, who is suitable for robotic surgery? The same robot that is used. Uh, for small kidney tumour, we use a precise way of cutting and then stitch it up exactly with the same robot that you saw. For bladder cancer, what are the symptoms of bladder cancer? Usually none, but some patients do have blood in the urine. Whether you can see it or you can't see it, there's still blood in the urine. Other patients may come with urine problem, as if they have a urine tract infection, like urgent, always get urgent, always look for toilet, or frequently looking for toilet. Then for bladder cancer, we were asking why is the treatment in the bladder important? The main aim is to reduce the chance cancer will come back so that you don't get cancer coming back again. For prostate cancer, every man wants to reduce the number of times they get a biopsy and one of the ways to avoid unnecessary multiple biopsies is first do an MRI scan so that we can find where to target it and then do the biopsy together with an MRI that fills with our ultrasound image. Then the last thing we ask is that can a robot surgery prevent urine leak or erection problem? Uh, you saw how precise the robot can be used, uh, but the answer is no. It doesn't mean that using robot, there will be no side effect. It just reduces it. But make sure you find, uh, um, always go for a second opinion. I tell my patients, all go for a second opinion, check out the different doctors who can uh, treat the cancer and then make a decision after that. All right? And... Thank you very much.